right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming, both uh, in person and on Zoom. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm one of the ECHO fellows. Um, so today, I'm going to present on the ECHO cardiovascular evaluation of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The reason we, uh, <clears throat> the reason I decided on this topic is because um, recently I've seen quite a few cases of it in the ECHO lab, and uh, you know, as a, um, I think. You know, at the general, they probably see it on a day-to-day -day basis here. I, you know, we see it frequently, but not that frequent. So I figured this will be a nice opportunity for us to just review uh, some of the echo findings of HCM, some of the pathophysiology, and at the end, talk about what are some of the important things to put in the report, uh, which I think for, uh, for junior trainees like myself uh, will be uh, important uh, to keep our re report consistent and useful for clinicians. Uh, all right, let's go. So I don't have any conflict of interest, Sally. Um, so here are the outlines for the, today's talk. So we're gonna first talk a little bit about background, about prevalence and genetics of HCM, and uh, we're gonna look at some histopathology, and then we're gonna delve into sort of the uh, echo evaluation of HCM, which is a bulk of this talk. And in that uh, portion, we're gonna talk about various phenotype of HCM, how to recognize it based on uh, sort of long axis and short axis images, we're going to talk about uh, importance evaluating systolic and diastolic function HCM, uh, especially the diastolic function, which is a bit different than just your normal day-to-day -day patient. We're going to talk about how to evaluate LVOT gradients, and MR, and to the sonographers who are very, you know, experienced at this, this, this is not news, but for someone, uh, you know, for a cardiology resident at the beginning of their training, this may be important when they're coming in to do overnight study uh, to not, uh, you know, uh, confuse MR and LVOT signals. And then we're going to talk briefly about perioperative guidance for septal alcohol ablation and role of echo in that. And lastly, we're going to have a few sort of cases, uh, very short cases, uh, differentiating um, uh, HCM and other phenotypic causes of um, LVH. So here are the objectives, um, and uh, we're going to go into background. So the definition of HCM really is a normal LV hypertrophy in the absence of other causes. And these other causes can be, you know, infiltrated cardiomyopathy, uh, can be, um, you know, amyloidosis, can be other uh, sort of uh, valvular issues, uh, congenital issues, aortic stenosis, aortic coarctation, causing severe hypertension, and then increased afterload causing LVH. You can have metabolic causes. We don't see this very often, but they do exist, like Fabry's, hemochromatosis, can all cause a normal LV hypertrophy. So when... Uh, so if there's LVH in the absence of uh, all the other causes, so and then and if uh, a gene cause a disease causing gene is identified, um, then you know patient, patients may meet diagnosis of HCM. And the prevalence in the USA is actually quite common. Uh, you know, it's much more common than I thought it would be. So it's about one in two hundred to one in five hundred for asymptomatic, and one in three thousand for symptomatic. So that's a lot of patients with potential HCM. So the diagnostic criteria, like I said, it has to be myocardial thickening in the absence of other causes. And uh, the cutoff typically for diagnosis of HCM is 15 millimeters or greater anywhere in the LV, uh, measured at end diastolic uh, phase. And uh, the cutoff can be lowered to 13 to 14 millimeter if there's a family history of HCM or if the patient tested gene positive for one of the causal variant of HCM. So the genetic of HCM, there's most, many, many genes, uh, you know, that have been identified as potential causal uh, genes for uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, most of the uh, genes identified are related to mutations coding for the sarcomere complex, uh, which is a sarcomere is essentially the basic contractile uh, unit of a muscle. It's compo uh, com composed of these uh, myosin, myosin binding protein, this troponin complex, myosin heavy chain, and, uh, you know, uh, this complex together is what generates the force of contraction in the muscle. So about more than eight genes have identified two of the most common ones, um, and uh, cardiology residents will need to know this for their exam, is the uh, myosin heavy chain 7 and uh, myosin, binding chain, uh, myosin binding protein C3. So two of these uh, accounts for more than 70% of the uh, patient population who tested genotype positive. Despite this, over 40% of the patients actually do not have a causal gene identified. So with this mutation, um, it essentially causes massive um, uh, myocardial hypertrophy anywhere in the ventricle. can be RV, can be LV. Here is a uh, pathology specimen of a heart. 
You can see the RV is significantly abnormal, the LV is significantly abnormal, very thickened. The pot muscles are hypertrophied as well. Uh, the cortex are thickened. And when we look at the histology, we see that it's not just the size of the muscle, it's how the muscles are arranged. So in HCM, the muscle bundles are not arranged in your typical linear fashion. There's a lot of disorganization. The muscles often don't connect to each other. They often branch off in weird locations. So even though there's a lot of muscle, the actual um, arrangement and function of it is abnormal. And because of the severe LV hypertrophy, uh, there's a lot of fibrosis inside that uh, inside this very, very thick muscle. And uh, the LV cavity gets smaller. So over time, people develop systolic and diastolic dysfunction despite having normal ejection fraction. In fact, these people will have super normal ejection fraction. You will often, yeah, I think it's over 65 in the 70 with the cavity so small. <clears throat> Some of the associate features uh, for this, um, uh, for HCM can be uh, you know, a normal mitral valve, leaflets, a normal subvalvular mitral valve apparatus, a myocardial bridge, myocardial crypts. Uh, myocardial crypts is an interesting one where sometimes they can have a little bit of indentation in the mid ventricular septum. Uh, when we do definitive imaging, sometimes um, you know we see this abnormal flow into the septum, which uh, can uh, be mistaken for VSD at times. And Grace and I saw an interesting case the other day where we thought it was VSD, but they actually had a CT demonstrating a myocardial crypt, uh, which is cool. So the typical presentation of HCM, you know, most of the time, uh, you know, 60% of the time patients are asymptomatic. They're referred to cardiologists for evaluation because, you know, someone somewhere uh, did a screening ECG or they heard a murmur and there was a systolic murmur where there was LVH on ECG and uh, or uh, at time of family screening, you know, we have a first degree relative who just got diagnosed HCM. And... Um, but 30 to 40% of patients may have symptoms and they may present to hospital on their first presentation of HCM as sudden cardiac death. Um, you know, HCM is one of the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in the U.S. Uh, in the young. And people can have exertional symptoms from their LVOT obstruction, their systolic and diastolic dysfunction presenting with you know, exertional dyspnea, and they can have arrhythmic events like AFib, VT, VF. So some of the ECG findings in HCM, so this is, uh, you know, can be quite abnormal. So this is one of the typical findings. Uh, perhaps one of the cardiology residents want to take a crack at this. Oh, there's none of the ones here. <laughs> All right, okay, so I will just uh, walk through it, uh, walk through this. So, the, you know, sinus rhythm, we have this profound alveation of large QS complexes in the, um, in the lateral leads, and we have this very, very abnormal, sharp T-wave inversions. Uh, so this is, you know, ECG finding, uh, consistent with apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, of course, you have to rule you know, other causes like ischemia and intracranial abnormality, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but this is a pretty classic so Yamaguchi ECG for apical HCM. This one also is, um, is one of the classic uh, exam ECGs for HCM. So this is an uh, ECG for septal HCM. So here we see what we call a dagger Q wave. Um, so very, very large, very, very sharp and deep. Uh, Q waves at the end of sort of uh, infralateral leads. This is because uh, in septal HCM, the septum is so thick and uh, there's lots of conduction uh, through the septum at the initial phase of depolarization. So you have this exaggerated Q wave. Um, so this is septal HCM. All right. Mm -hmm. Then um, the clinical red flags of HCM that uh, you know people should pay attention to in clinic and also when we do echoes is that. Um, you know, these are all clinical red flag of HCM that increase risk of sudden cardiac death. So if there's a family history of sudden cardiac death, if there's massive LVH defined by wall thickness more than 30 millimeters, if there's unexplained syncope, if there's any LV dysfunction, less EF, less than 50%, presence of apical aneurysm independent of size, and uh, you know, excessive fibrosis on MR, uh, quantified by more than 50% LV mass um, of LGE, and NSVT on culture, all of these are high-risk features clinically and imaging findings of HCM that increases their um, risk for sudden cardiac death. From an echo perspective, therefore, it is important for us to quantify the, how, uh, as accurately as possible the degree of wall thickening and the uh, very careful analysis of the ejection fraction and uh, as well as uh, considering using echo contrast to real apical aneurysm. So let's go to echocardiographic evaluation of HCM. So first we're gonna talk about phenotype and wall thickness. So 
remember, so in HCM, the thickening can occur anywhere in the LV. So people can present with a variety of uh, phenotypes, but these are the more classic presentation of HCM. So the most common one is what we call the sigmoidal HCM, where the thickening is, uh, you know, there's still thickening everywhere else in the LV, but the predominant focal thickening is in the proximal septum. Now, this is the most common presentation, but it's also the one that is associated with the least amount of genotype positive. Um, the reason you can see is, you know, we see so much hypertension and people often have sigmoid septum, proximal septal hypertrophy. So this can often be uh, sort of misdiagnosed or misrepresented as just uh, hypertensive cardiomyopathy. Then the next second most common, about 30 to 40 percent, this is kind of like the classic HCM where you, know, you see on the echo, everyone's like, oh, yeah, this is HCM for sure. And this is a reverse curve. And the reverse curve essentially is <laughs> the most of the thickening happens in the mid ventricular septum. So you have this uh, shape distortion in the LV cavity. And this is where, you know, as the septum thickens into the LVOT, you get um, the cystic anterior motion of the mitral valve, LVOT obstruction. This is associated with the most amount of the uh, highest proportion of genotype positive, 80% of them. And then the apical HCM and neutral HCM are some of the more rare uh, causes of it, accounted for about 10% each. Apical HCM, essentially, there's a failure of ta tapering at the apex, giving you this, this uh, very thick apical um, appearance. As well, 30% of the patients here are genotype positive. And the neutral HCM is a bit more subtle, sometimes it can be um, uh, more easy to miss, and this is more consistent with more of a diffuse of the hypertrophy. The septum is still thick, but certainly it doesn't have that mid ventricular septum thickening. Uh, it's more of a straight line here, and that's about 40% of the margin of type positive. So let's talk about the sigmoid septum. You know, if I didn't tell you this patient at HCM, you, you know, we'd probably look at this, you know, a, a heart like this on the right, be like, ah, this is probably hypertension, you know, sigmoid septum. But this is where, you know, to get an accurate measurement of the wall thickness here, often they can exceed 50 millimeters, which means the diagnosis of uh, HCM. And uh, the other thing important to pay attention to is that there's the associated mitral valve abnormalities. Here, you know, there is mitral SAM, which, you know, points you to, um, you know, some abnormalities and associated feature of HCM. So in the sigmoid um, sort of uh, HCM, the LV cavity is more of an ovoid shape because as in diastole, when the LV expands, you can see that there's a, you know, the LV cavity is more of an oval shape. Okay. So next, this is the reverse curve, HCM. As you can see, there's um, remark, uh, there's market thickening of the mid ventricular septum. Okay. The LV cavity is significantly distorted, giving you more of a convex shape, LV cavity. And in the short axis, you can see uh, the mid ventricular septum is quite significantly thicker. Okay. And when this happens, again, um, uh, the LV thickens at mid, uh, at mid uh, septum, and then that causes the LVOT to be narrow and causing the you know, significant amount of mitral sap, which I'm just drawing there. Right there. Right here. That's mitral sap. So this, these are just, again, some uh, apical images of uh, the reverse curve. As you can see, I just want to point out how distorted that cavity is, how convex that shape is. So this is the classic sort of um, reverse curve HCM. Okay. Apical HCM, you know, is commonly referred to a spade-shaped uh, ventricle. So here is a spade for those who play cards. Um, the idea is that there's failure of apical tapering and it gets progressively more thickened as we get into the apex, and therefore it's sort of the ventricular cavity narrows. And with apical HCM, sometimes it can be very difficult to appreciate on non-contrast images because of poor endocardial definition. We may, you know, if we don't see the apex very well, sometimes this can be easily missed, which is why it's important. If there's any suspicion for apical HCM, it's important that we use definite contrast or do we use echo contrast in general. And uh, there's one more thing that's associated with apical HCM that's coming commonly missed, which is apical aneurysm. Um, so here we can see that, you know, on the just non-contrast images, it looks like the end of the myocardial border is here. And, uh, you know, you see there's apical thickening. But when we actually use definity contrast on the same patient, 
we see that there is a um, you know apical dyskinesis and the presence of an apical aneurysm. Um, obviously, the imaging axis is a little bit different, but this just again shows you uh, how important it is to be thorough and systematic in our approach to um, uh, not miss these things because this patient will be at higher risk of cardiac uh, sudden cardiac death because of presence of that apical aneurysm. And lastly, you know, the neutral septum, like I said, can be a bit more subtle. Um, so this is one I found from the black book. You, as we can see, you know, there's diffuse thickening everywhere through the LV. There's no particular focal thickening. And this one can be pretty easily, uh, you know, can be missed. as just, you know, hypertensive heart disease. Um, and, you know, on MRI, we, I think we appreciate uh, this a bit better. So here are, this is a sigmoid septum variant. This is the a reverse curve variant, this is the neutral septum variant. You can see in neutral septum, the septum is straight. The LV cavity is not distorted. In reverse curve, the LV cavity has significant distortion with a convex shape. And in sigmoid, uh, the LV cavity is more oval. So there's lots of thickening everywhere in the LV. So where do we measure the thickening? How many numbers do we report? Because you know, if you read an MRI report, I think the MRI guys, you know, they report the LV thickness at every single level. So it ends up having like, you know, 15 different measurements. It's good because then you really give some representative, um, you know, overall phenotype of the heart. But for us in echo, um, sometimes the endocardial definition is not great. Sometimes, you know, we're going through lots of cases. And I, I don't know if we have an hour and a half to read each case like the MRI guys do. Um, so which one is more important? You know, so traditionally, we, um, uh, you know, when, when people first started evaluating HCM using echo, they divided uh, the mid-ventricular section into four segments, into anterior septum, posterior se se septum, posterior wall, and lateral wall. They kind of reported four numbers. And over time, uh, you know, people developed a variety of scores uh, in order to sort of um, um, quantify the degree of LVH. There's a very variety of indexes. Um, you know, people have come up with. In the end, studies have shown that none of this really matters. The most important is to report the maximal thickness. So if we look at the ASE guidelines on how to report uh, on HCM, and, uh, you know, they say report the septal thickness, the posterior wall thickness, which we normally do with our personal law anyways, and report the maximal th thickness. So I think those are the three measurements we must make on every single patient uh, who we're evaluating for HCM. Okay. And recall, I guess you have the comments on the maximum thickness is being measured where? Anywhere in the album. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, you let the, yeah Dr. Kyle, you're right. Uh, so we have to say maximal thickness and the location of the uh, of the maximal thickness. And uh, remember, 30 millimeter is the high risk feature. 15 is diagnostic, 13 to 14 if they have um, family history or genotype positive, and 30 is high risk. And once we evaluate the LV thickness, it's important not to forget the RV thickness. In about 30% of the case, uh, you know, the same uh, genotype mutations that cause LV hypertrophy also cause RV hypertrophy. So and this is the reverse septum case we just saw. And you can see there's marked RV hypertrophy. Okay? And uh, sometimes people, you know, uh, people can also develop uh, dynamic RV obstruction, intracavity RV gradient. So that's why it's important to have a bit more careful assessment of the RV and pay attention to the RV thickness. In terms of the cutoffs for RV thickness, there's really no standard way. Uh, you know, when we first started, people uh, started to sort of categorize uh, the severity of the RV thickening. But recently, sort of, I think that has fallen out of fashion. People started just to categorize the presence and absence of RV thickening. So, uh, you know, Marin, uh, who did a lot of uh, earlier papers on HCM, suggests that we just use a cutoff 5 millimeter. Uh, you know, if it's more than 5 millimeter of RV thickness at end diastole, then that's RVH. And severe RVH, it, uh, it's more than a centimeter. And for me, I think that's, uh, that's a very uh, simplistic and straightforward way to do this. And I, I, you know, I like simple things. So I really prefer this method. And so now we're going to go on to evaluation of systolic and diastolic function. So the reason why this is important is that overall, as the mass of LVH occurs, there's progressive worsening um, fibrosis within the LV and within the RV. So this is uh, cardiac MRI imaging of um, uh, some HCM patients using uh, late gadolinium, late gadolinium enhancement, essentially looking for a scar. So here we can see there's lots of white spots, which is the gadolinium signal 
in the um, in the septum, in the uh, in the septum here, and in the RV hinge point, where um, there's a lot of mechanical stress. So you can see these represents area of fibrosis. As fibrosis progresses in the LV, you know the LV gets stiffer, so there's progressive worsening diastolic function and as well as systolic dysfunction. And like I mentioned before, um, it's important for us to use um, echo contrast when we evaluate the systolic function um, because oftentimes the systolic, uh, the LV cavity can be significantly distorted. So I think some of the geometric assumptions that we normally do, uh, we normally make when we trace symptoms may not necessarily apply uh, in patients with HCM because what we think is the endocardial, definite, uh, endocardial border may not actually be accurate. It's important to use diff uh, echo contrast to outline the endocardial border. In addition, it will also help us to screen for you know, impulse aneurysms and things like that. Right. In terms of diastolic function, uh, this really is somewhat of a moving target um, in HCM. There's a lot of research going into uh, evaluation of diastolic function in HCM. The diastolic function in a normal patient is not the, the most reliable at the best of cases. Um, so in HCM, certainly some of these parameters uh, may not be accurate. And, but the ASC 2016 guidelines suggest using the following four parameters for diastolic function in HCM. The average E to E prime ratio greater than 14, that we use all the time for just regular patients. LV, um, LA volume index more than 34, that we use for regular patients. P TR velocity greater than 2.8, that we use for regular diastology. And lastly, instead of using tissue doppler velocity, they recommend using the the difference in flow duration between the uh, atrial regurgitant signal on the pulmonary in the pulmonary vein uh, flow uh, in the pulmonary vein Doppler and the mitral inflow uh, A wave. Uh, so measuring the difference in the flow duration of these two signals. If it's more than uh, thirty milliseconds, that's abnormal. Okay. And uh, this last one, I'm not sure how feasible it is, um, you know, on the day to day practice because. We don't really get great pulmonary vein. Like some patients, we get great pulmonary vein dollars, and some patients, uh, you know, we do it, and it's just, you know, like snow everywhere. So I, I'm not really. Sure. Yeah, and, and the and the hardest component to get is actually the ear reversal. Yeah, so the S and the D is actually easier. So, so I'm not sure how, how applicable this is. And you have to get it on one frame, so you can measure it. Yeah, yeah. So it is it's uh, it's tough, right? So um, John, can I ask a quick question? Is this the same? I guess this is a question to everybody. Is this the same as the interventricular relaxation time, or is this because it it's is a, not. okay? It is not. Yeah, it's not. And it, it, and is it just like the regular guidelines? Is it is it two or more of the criteria? Is all four criteria? So this is where um, so in HCM diastology can never be normal. So I think there's no normal. So if you have let if you have uh, less than two of these. You have essentially if you have only one, uh, it's grade one. If you have two, it's inconclusive. If you have more than two, it's grade two. But if you have an elevated E to A ratio more than two, and you have low tissue doppler velocity, that's grade three. Okay. Uh, so this is based on the 2016 guidelines. It may change in the new diastology guidelines, uh, but this is currently what people recommend evaluation for. All right, and next we're going to spend some time talking about dynamic obstruction and MR. There's some chat. Oh, no, that's just Dr. Chow. Encouraging everyone to fill in the survey and go to our uh, valve talk this weekend or next weekend. Um, okay, so in HCM, like I said, uh, there's significant abnormalities in the intrinsic mitral valve as well as the uh, mitral valve apparatus. So here is a um, short axis of the echo uh, at the mitral valve pop level, demonstrating you know the some abnormalities of these mitral valve subvalvular apparatus. So in HCM, the pap muscle can often be uh, bifid, so they have two heads, and uh, they can often be anteriorly displaced, meaning they close they move closer to the um, to the ventricular septum. And sometimes it can have abnormal insertion into the mitral valve. Some of them insert into the septum. Some of them insert directly into the mitral valve. All kinds of possibilities are possible. But when the patent muscles are anteriorly displaced, it certainly brings the entire mitral valve apparatus closer to the septum, closer to the LVOT, uh, and increasing the disposition for LVOT obstruction. And this is just, uh, you know, as I was saying, so.
sometimes the pack muscle inserts directly into the mitral valve leaflet at the mid body. When that happens, it doesn't provide the same support it does uh, at, to the free edge of the anterior leaflet, and that anterior leaflet free edge is allowed to move, you know, with uh, the flow of systole causing LVOT obstruction. You know, this is a nice MRI case demonstrating that. Okay. And the mitral valve itself is abnormal. So in this uh, nice recent review, or sorry, nice recent Jack paper, uh, these authors took the mitral valve of uh, uh, HCM genotype positive patients and HCM genotype negative patients. What, uh, what they found was that in the HCM genotype positive patients, um, there is a lot more um, disorganization of, of the tissue fibers in the mitral valve leaflets. And, um, and uh, so these top are the normal mitral valve. You can see the fibers are very straight, very organized. But in the uh, HCM patients, the fibers are sort of all over the place. There is uh, extensive production of these uh, sort of extracellular matrix, but they're not really organized. When that happens, the tissue kind of loses its uh, rigidity and increases its uh, disposition to sort of flail around and move around everywhere. And uh, turns out that patients who have genotype positive, they also have base, their mitral valve leaflets are slightly longer than people, people who are genotype negative. When that happens, if the mitral valve becomes a bit longer, they're more uh, prone to the, to the flow and drag forces of the LVOT and increases their risk of um, uh, LVOT obstruction. And that further deteriorates the integrity of the uh, mitral valve leaflets and it's a vicious cycle. Okay. So it's actually a combination of subvalvular apparatus abnormalities, intrinsic mitral valve, appara um, intrinsic mitral valve abnormalities, and thickening of the uh, septum. Uh, narrows the LVOT. All of these contributes to uh, sort of dynamic LVOT obstruction uh, due to systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. It's here um, you can see that mitral valve sort of moves into the septum during systole. Okay. All right. So these are just um, some more representative images. Here is a color Doppler. Notice now there's flow acceleration at the right at the level of these SAM. And sometimes when we look at color Doppler. Color Doppler can actually, there can be a concurrent intracavity uh, intra gradient as well. So the flow acceleration starts much lower. But in this case, it starts at the level of the obstructions of right here. Okay. And this is just an M mode. Uh, I put this one uh, just for Dr. Howard because I know he loves the M mode for HCM. And um, so here we can see that in systole, okay, so right after QRS, there's systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, so causing. So here's the anterior leaflet, so uh, you know, it gets closer to the um, uh, to the ventricular septum. And uh, when there is LVOT obstruction, there's often concurrent MR, because as the anterior leaflet is being pulled into the LVOT, there's a coaptation gap formed between the anterior and posterior leaflet. And when that happens, uh, you can think of, uh, of it as almost like an anterior restriction. So you lead to, um, sorry, uh, I, I, I misspoke. You can think of it as an anterior pathology leading to a posteriorly directed MR. Um, and, um, but the jet of it may not always be posterior. Um, people have actually looked at what are the predictability of uh, pre this posteriorly directed MR jet in HCM. Turns out that uh, sometimes the MR jet can be more central, sometimes it can be posterior. So um, just because it's not posterior doesn't necessarily mean it's not related to the LVOT obstruction. How do we quantify the, the severity of LVT obstruction? So there are two ways. One way, um, it, we can actually do some complicated math uh, using the M mode. Uh, so we can use essentially the ratio of the duration of the uh, mitral valve to septal contact and uh, to the time of the uh, essentially beginning of SAM to the SAM septal contact. So essentially the duration of SAM to the time it took for the mitral valve to move into the LVOT. Uh, and that, the ratio of that times 25 plus 25 millimeter mercury gives you an estimate of the gradient. As you can see, this is a very complicated math equation. I don't want to sit there and, and trace this, you know, I, I, but if you want, if you're writing echo boards, uh, if you're studying for Royal College, maybe you need to know this. Um, no. Most of the time we use <laughs> the modified Bernoulli equation, which is uh, 4 equals 4v squared. But that comes with some pitfalls. That and was, um, that was actually, I think, the lead derived uh, during the MO period. 
So I don't think we would actually do that these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah I actually haven't used it. Uh, yeah, I uh, compare. Yeah, I have. I've just just seen it in textbooks, but I've personally never seen anyone do this calculation. <laughs> yeah. So, so when we do the uh, Doppler profile of the LVOT, there's a classic uh, shimitar uh, shape uh, of the LVOT Doppler or dagger shape, uh, you know, with your own weapon. Um, <laughs> so the reason why it's called a shimitar t uh, shape is that you see kind of this curvature in the uh, LVOT Doppler. So you can see as the LVOT flow starts, uh, initially there's no obstruction, but as the micro valve moves closer to the septum, causing worsening obstruction, there's a rapid acceleration of flow due to that obstructive physiology, giving you this uh, nice curved uh, shimitar appearance. So obviously we take uh, the peak velocity and do four times velocity squared, that, that gives us an estimate of the gradient. And the cutoff for chemodynamically significant gradient is 30 millimeters. Um, and uh, that's what doesn't matter if it's at rest or provoked. 30 millimeters is uh, of mercury is a significant gradient. And usually over 50 millimeter of mercury, that's when people need to start thinking about some fancy therapies like septal reduction therapy. It could be shock spin. You look at it upside down. Right. Uh, yes, it could be shark spin. For the Asians. For the Asians. <laughs> for the ethnically correct. Well, I guess there's, you know, either a weapon or a shark spin matter is that thing. But, so, um, so the, the, I guess the caveat, the important thing about qualify LVOT obstruction or quantify LVOT obstruction is mitral regurgitation. So, and, uh, sub, and concurrent mitral uh, MR contamination. So, <coughs> when I put the actual Doppler signal, like the CW signal over the LVOT, if we are right over the LVOT and we can get away from the left atrium, sometimes we can have a very clean signal of this dagger-shaped appearance, giving us what we think is the LVOT gradient. But if we move the signal just a touch over into the left and catch a bit of the left atrium, sometimes we catch a bit of the MR Doppler profile. And this is where sometimes it's not so easy to differentiate because look here, if you, this is a nice example illustrating what the LVOT obstructive signal is and what the MR signal is. But these two, if you, if you, you know, get them mixed up, the gradient can be quite different between 40 and 96, right? 96 is like, oh my God, this person's going to rest. 40 <laughs> is like, oh, I can just start with a beta blocker. So it's quite, um, it's quite a different uh, value because MR jet tends to a bit higher velocity, so it tends to overestimate the gradient. In this case, you know, we have nice overlapping signals. You can pretty much differentiate with MR and what's the LVOT obstruction. And one way to uh, differentiate that <coughs> is the timing, right? So in non-LVOT obstruction related MR, just like let's say secondary MR, the MR starts at the onset of the QRS and uh, in the isovolemic contraction phase. And you finish, uh, you know, so it starts right at the onset of the QRS. It's a very uh, round Doppler profile. And whereas um, the LVOT obstruction signal starts in mid to late systole, as because at the beginning of systole there's no there's SAM, but there hasn't been obstruction yet, so there's really no increased uh, uh, velocity. But sometimes it's not that obvious. So this is a case of um, sort of LVOT obstruction signal, and the uh, posteriorly directed MR signal secondary to the LVOT obstruction. So you can see both of these signals have that sort of a dagger or shimitar kind of appearance. So how do you tell? And this is where sort of, I think we need to pay more attention about where the CW is located. So here on this image, you can see the CW is mostly through the mitral valve. It's not in the LVOT. So you know this is MR. And here the CW is in the LVOT and it's missing completely the left atrium. So you can be confident that this is the LVOT signal. But sometimes, as we all know, based on the imaging window, it's not that easy to differentiate. So, you know, as a reader, we're sitting there sort of scratching our heads, thinking, is this severe LVOT obstruction? Is this MR contamination? So one thing we can do to help us is look at where the signal ends. In LVOT obstruction, the signal ends right when um, ejection finishes. Okay, So it finishes earlier than the MR. because um, at the beginning of diastole, you know, the mitral valve returns from the LVOT back to its neutral position. 
at the moment it comes off the septum, there's no more obstruction. So the flow, so the uh, the uh, the alveolar obstructive signal stops. But because he hasn't quite returned back to his neutral position, there's still a slight coaptation gap. So the MR continues. So the MR jet actually finishes later. So here you can see the um, the alveolar signal finishes right at the uh, outside of the T, right at the end of the T wave. But here it actually goes. It, the MR signal goes past the T wave into uh, into the isovolumic relaxation phase. So I think this is one subtle detail that can help us differentiate besides looking at where the Doppler uh, is aligned to. The other thing, if you go back, Sean, um, you know, I, think, I, I think for us, you can see the stenographers, um, because sometimes it's difficult to differentiate, you can actually do CW across the MR like it's done here, and you can show what the MR signal looks like. So when you have a profile that has the LVOT, that you think might have some contamination, yeah, at least you have an understanding of what the MR um, profile looks like, and right. more importantly, what the peak MR velocities are. Right and here, you see they're eight meters per second. Right, so it gives you something to compare with when you look at the LVOT. Okay, it's a good point. Um, sounds good. And uh, this, yeah, so this is just another pictorial diagram about you know trying to optimize our CW jets, uh, so our CW sort of um, signal. To uh, to minimize uh, contamination from the left and trip. Uh, just another point about this, I apologize, is that um, it, it's actually quite difficult sometimes to get away from the MR signal, even though it's post directed. And part of that is that where a sand septal contact occurs may not be fully aligned with actually the LVOT and with the aortic valve or the apical 5 and apical 3 shear reviews. So it's not the same as doing CW across the aortic valve. It's a little bit more. It's a little bit more laterally direct. Right? right, right. So we may need to orient the probe a little bit. To... My point is that it's very difficult sometimes to get away from the more termination. Yeah. This is where, like, I think, yeah, because I, you know, Flora and I had cases in the lab where you know we spent like thirty minutes talking about this MR, this LVOT, and both of us getting frustrated. And, uh, and that's why it's important. Yeah, to just get the MR signal. I, you, you guys know I love CW plus the MR for a long time. We don't do it enough. It's very simple. Yes. Um, so this is just a pictorial representation of sort of non-HCM MR. So you can see it starts right by the QRS, a nice round envelope, whereas HCM-related MR and both LVOT signal have that sort of dagger shimitar shape, and then it's it's where they finish that helps you differentiate as well. That's a great diagram, actually. Yeah. Is that from one of the reviews? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great diagram. Okay. All right. Um, so we're going to finish off talking about MR uh, in sort of LVOT sort of provocative maneuver. So important to always do this. So just remember, if we make the LV cavity smaller, we can get more obstruction because the mitral valve is closer to the septum. So things like Valsalva, squat to stand, uh, post PVC often give us a higher obstructive signal. Whereas if you ask them to stand to squat or you give them some phenol or if they're bradycardic, often the LV cavity uh, it's bigger and that gives you less obstruction. Uh, obviously, you know, it's hard to do these in the lab, so mostly we just do Val Solo. We're not going to. At least going to stand the spot, yeah, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think ammo nitrate is also no longer available. We used to do that yeah. uh, in our lab. So, that's, uh, yeah. so we don't do that anymore. Yeah. But uh, for, again, for the cardiology residents, this is a uh, fair game for the exam. But, just but, have to go cold. Yeah, to, uh, to be fair, the challenge is actually Val Solo because. Uh, this is the one that we use all the time. The problem is how do you standardize the Valsalva? I mean, that, that's one of the challenges. And we're currently working very hard in getting uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Emma Jory from Princeton, who has developed a whole program, to try to make this more standardized, especially in light of all the uh, new medication that treats uh, the alpha tract gradient. So that's so uh, we're working very hard on bringing him over so we can show how to do this uh, more consistently among all of us. And uh, so briefly, we're going to talk about perioperative vehicles. So, you know, the idea is that there's essentially two ways of septal reduction strategies. You can use alcohol ablation where people insert a small catheter into the septal perforator that feeds the septum. And uh, you inject ethanol that essentially kills off the myocardium here. Myocardium scars reduces the thickness of the myocardium, of the septum. Or people can actually go in and surgically cut. So how echo plays a role in this is that we can actually inject definitive or echo contrast into the septal perforator, allowing us to identify the precise 
area of um, myocardium that's fed by that septic perforator to improve procedural success and procedural um, safety. And uh, people have shown that uh, using perioperative uh, echo contrast injections uh, to guide alcohol septal ablation uh, have reduced infarct size, reduced risk of complications, uh, and uh, improved uh, procedural success. And lastly, I just want to talk briefly about how to differentiate HCM from other phenotype causes of LVH. You know, I listed a few, I attached some, you know, echo clips of, um, of uh, you know, various causes of uh, LVH. Sometimes it's not, in, it, you know, it's not very obvious uh, on first pass uh, what the underlying etiology of the LVH is. And there can be certainly different pathologies that can all look very similar. Because certainly we look for associate features. If you think it's HCM, you look for apical aneurysm, you look for mitral valve abnormalities, you look for SAM. But, you know, sometimes uh, that may not always be present. So uh, one of the um, <coughs> ways people have suggested uh, in helping us differentiate various causes of LVH is using myocardial strain. Because in all these diffuse myopathic processes, the strain pattern can actually be quite helpful and informative. So, you know, I give you one case here, you know, EF is normal, there's sort of uh, <coughs> symmetric hypertrophy, and LV mass index is like in the moderate range, GLS is normal, and you look at it, you're like, ah, you know, looks okay, right? And then you look at the string pattern, and the string pattern gives you this. Um, sort of, uh, does anyone want to guess what what this is? This is actually, so I got this from a review, which I will give you the paper after. But in the review, this is hypertensive heart disease. So because, you know, remember in hypertensive heart disease, you have sometimes you have a, some, a little bit of a basal sigmoid thickening, so that correlates to slight decrease in strain in the basal septum. So this is more consistent with hypertension. But so the next one, this obviously, you know, I think, you know, we've seen enough clips of this uh, reverse curve uh, HCM, you know, massive LVH, more than 15 millimeter, slight reduction in strain. <laughs> and when we look at the strain pattern, we see that, you know, the septum and anterior where there's profound myocardial thickening, uh, Correlates to the area of decreased strain. Um, so this is uh, this, comp this is what we commonly refer to as sort of like the counterclockwise rotation of myocardial thickening, and uh, you know, that's the strain pattern for HCM. This one, uh, you know, um, there's diffuse sort of thickening. Uh, you know, pretty symmetric. There's a rate, uh, increased LV mass index. EF is normal. GLS is global. GLS is normal. So this one. Um, when you look at the string pattern, it's not very specific, it's kind of, uh, it's a little bit reduced maybe, but at the uh, basal septum, basal lateral, maybe due to, um, some imaging, uh, endocardial definition differences. And, uh, here you can see the aortic valve is very calcified. So this, in, so this is actually a case of aortic stenosis and, uh, the string pattern is mostly normal. Okay. And, uh, this one, uh, you know, so pretty classic one. Uh, again, diffuse thickening, massive LVA, decreased strain with, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Charles Shaver, starry night uh, kind of appearance of the myocardium. And this is a case of cardiac amyloidosis. The string pattern looks like cherry on top and diffuse strain everywhere. So, um, and lastly, this one, I do not have a moving image of it because uh, I do not have a case of it, uh, but essentially, uh, you know, posterior wall is a bit thickened, massive LVH, slight decrease in um, GLS, and the strain pattern is localized mostly to the basal inferior, to um, uh, basal infralateral and um, uh, mint inferior wall, and this is a case of Fabry's disease. Okay. So you can see in all these cases of LVH, the strain pattern can look very different. Dr. Nelfo is shaking his head. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I got this from uh, a nice review uh, of uh, 2020 from, uh, from Tanaka et al. Just talking about using uh, strain maps to uh, differentiate various causes of LVH. One thing they did include in this review paper that I didn't include an example of is athlete's heart. Because I think in this institution, we see a lot of uh, athletes who, do, you know, who comes in and they, they have LVH. And their ECG sometimes can be abnormal. They come up with uh, non-specific symptoms. And we do their echo, and the question is always, is this HCM or is this just athlete's heart? And in general, to differentiate this, you know, athlete's heart generally do not have profound LVH, like more than 15 millimeters. They generally have a normal RDs. They generally have, uh, you know, 
uh, symmetrical by atrial enlargement. They normally have normal diastolic function. And usually, if they uh, detrain for a few months, their LVH tends to regress, whereas none of that happens at HCN, right? So sometimes it's important to uh, think about these things when we try to differentiate athletes heart versus HCN. That, that's a big topic in um, national exams. And um, so to summarize, so you know, HCN is very common. Uh, so uh, we should suspect it if we see a maximum wall thickness of more than 15 millimeters or if we see any associated mitral abnormalities. And the four classic types are the reverse curve, sycamore septum, apical, and neutral septum. And uh, to report, uh, so what do we report on the echo? And this is what I want to talk about. And this is based on the 2011 ASE guidelines of, um, of report on HCM. And this is essentially what they think we should report, what they, they specify we should report in the echo report. And I think most of these we do already on a daily basis for, um, for everyone else. So again, report the septal posterior maximal LV dimensions and uh, LV EF, RV presence or absence of RV hypertrophy, uh, LV volume, LV diastolic function, PA pressures, we do that. And whether we, you know, we measure the LVOT obstruction and quantify the LVOT obstruction at rest and with Valsalva. And um, if we think sometimes it's difficult to differentiate, uh, MR versus LVOT signal, sometimes, I say sometimes, a TE can be helpful because uh, as I've, uh, that, you know, before I started doing TEs, I thought TE was great in this, but now that I'm doing this, sometimes I know, you know, it can be challenging on TE to, to uh, differentiate the signal, especially the trust gastric. Okay.